Good afternoon, everybody. I just I just start with some housekeeping rules. So we will let people, we'll give the time to people to just come after the very nice lunch break we had. So my name is Laura De Dominicis, and I'm an economic analyst in the director for regional urban policy. But in this moment, uh, I'm here as a work as a moderator for this session on uh, basically on uh, accounting the research evidence in support of the effective use of uh, cohesion policy, which uh, has been discussed uh, a little bit this morning during the panel discussion and also during the the session I just uh, attended. There was also some lively debate about the effectiveness of cohesion policy. So I'm very eager to see what uh, our colleagues and uh, fellow speakers are going to talk about. So we will have four presentations. So I advise, I suggest we will have like uh, 15 minutes for each presentation and we will have the Q&A session at the end of the four presentations, mainly because there will be also some uh, attendants who are uh, online connected. And I think that uh, the Zoom connection will close automatically when it's the closing time of the session. So to be able to give them also the option to talk at all the speakers to have ample uh, time to present their work and their ideas. Okay, and, and also for, um, so I first invite uh, Nadia Bessa to come here to present her work on um, the role of cohesion policy, uh, territorial tools, and the case of the sustainable urban development uh, of the city of Thessaloniki, in Greece. <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Kostatia Bessa, as you heard before, and I'm from Thessaloniki. I work for the region of Central Macedonia in Greece. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present our teamwork at the third joint EU Cohesion Policy Conference. Should I start this? I need some help, I think. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to talk about how we are trying to enhance the evidence-based territorial planning in our region with the new tool for us, the Sustainable Urban Development Observatory for the metropolitan area of the Saloniki. For the beginning, Okay, I found it out. Uh, I want us to say a few, as, to do a small deduction for our region, Central Macedonia, which is the largest region in Greece, as its, the, as its surface is more than 18,000 square kilometers. It consists of uh, seven regional units, which are divided into 38 municipalities. According to the latest census, which took place in 2021, the population of our region is almost 2 million. The capital of the region, our city Thessaloniki, uh, has more than half of the total population resides. The city of Thessaloniki is a complex urban system that includes the compact urban area, which consists of eight municipalities, the heart of the urban, and the network of uh, satellite towns. The very urban area is covered mostly with commercial, industrial, and recreation uses. Thessaloniki is a port city, and as the capital of the region, is also a, the center of economic and administrative life of northern Greece. It is crucial to mention that it is also a major educational and cultural center where four higher education institutes operate with more than 70,000 students. The previous program, uh, programming period, 14 to 20, as a region, we have the benefit to plan and implement the strategy for sustainable urban development of the metropolitan area of Thessaloniki, as we exploit the new tool, integrated territorial investments for sustainable urban development. So as an urban authority, as an intermediate body, we planned and we're still implementing the stra this strategy. We managed to combine urban renewal with such action that will promote education, economic development, social inclusion, and environmental protection. I have to mention that we work with a prospect. 
to establish a paradigm of metropolitan planning, which entails the collaboration of local citizens, civil society, industry, and various levels of government for this innovative model. We succeed to have been included as a group practice in reform, a project uh, of indirect pro uh, European program. We also have been awarded with Bravo Governance. And finally, we, being, we have been included as a model for in LT's guide for uh, SAMS, uh, for SAMS uh, sustainable urban mobility plans, model of metropolitan authorities. Uh, in order to present you in short our strategy, I will say to you that our strategy is uh, built in uh, four uh, axes uh, in order to respond to all challenges, capabilities, weaknesses, and perspectives. We have first Thessaloniki competitive and innovative, Thessaloniki cohesion, and third Thessaloniki green and resilient. Fourth, Thessaloniki effect effective. Today, we will focus on the fourth axis and especially how we manage the integrated urban government to enhance the, the last, the integrated urban governance and metropolitan synergies. All we did is to establish a sustainable urban development observatory, which actually constitutes a crucial part of our strategy. According to UN Habitat, an urban observatory is a local network of stakeholders responsible for producing, analyzing, and dissemination data on a meaningful set of indicators that reflect collectively prioritized issues for sustainable development in a given area or country. That is that we try to apply. Let's find out what we have done until today. The Saloniki Urban Lab is based on monitoring indicators, data collection, and thesis and thesis report. Our scope is to provide and interpret information from urban fraction in multiple territorial levels and not only aggregate in administrative ones. Settlement and neighborhood levels can increase and be improved as an appropriate level to implement sustainability principles in urban transformation processes. For this scope, our Urban Lab relays on GIS platform for the compilation of the indicators and the interpretation of the analysis of the spatial aspect. There is no blueprint, but multiple pathways to sustainable urban development, as there are so many different circumstances, priorities, and ambitions. The most difficult and crucial was to develop the indicators, which are the tools, I'm sorry, for that, <laughs> that allow planners uh, and decision makers to measure the impacts of the implementing uh, urban planning and policies. We organize four thematic areas. The first thematic area X is territorial and economic development. The second sum is sustainable urban mobility. The third environment, urban environment. The fourth social. In total, we have 57 indicators that we have selected according to reliability and feasibility criteria. This, of course, was the first task of our urban lab. The data collection was based mainly on research, publication and reports, data mining in ARCIS and databases, interviews and experts groups, field surveys, sample surveys. Let's see some first results from the work until now. For the first theme, territorial and economic development sector, we can say that there is a steadiness in the urban development. Demographics and population density are also stable. And although we had an entirety in the city's redesign system, mainly because we are waiting for the metro, we are waiting for the metro to be the main public transportation in Thessaloniki, we hope that we will finish in 2023. The last year, and we can say from 2021 and after, there are many, there are a series of spatial promising spatial plans for the city. We can also say that Thessaloniki is the innovation pole for all the region. And hopefully, hopefully at this sector, the messages are very promising. We have also to mention the tourist development, which has a conscious incre continuous increase. For the second theme, 
we can say the state of the pollution has been improved, the air pollution. The water and the sewer network covers all the city. We still have a problem with green per capita and we're working on it. Although there we have good accessibility, we have to prepare better our city because climate is changing and especially for temperature and flood. We still have to work in the field of recycling and waste management system, although we have made many steps ahead. I would like to show a small survey, a first sample of our survey we did for green open public spaces. This, this was a research we did. In the first map with the green colors, we try to, the variety of green color, we try to find out the level of the green of the vegetation. In the second, just after that, I think the colors are not so good in this uh, room. We didn't uh, have to see this before. I'm sorry for that. Uh, with pink, we have those uh, areas that don't, they don't have lights. And with yellow is the areas that they have lights. This is not only for the use of the place, it's also for the security. On the third, uh, with, uh, I don't know if you can see it, with pink, or with pink and yes, light blue, is the places uh, accordingly if they have uh, accessibility for people with uh, disabilities. And the last one is it when we have, uh, with red, we have playing grounds and with blue have uh, infrastructure for sports and other like this. We are trying to prepare such uh, humbles and researches for the next period because we think they'll be crucial for the planning. As for the urban mobility theme, theme we, have, uh, we are, have a lot to say. We have an airport, Macedonia, which is identified as th a third category airport. We have to work uh, to, to do with our port. I think that we have a lot to do with this that we have some messages that is going to be better organized. There are significant road flows from neighbor regions and countries. Train passenger flows are stable uh, if we don't take into account the last period. And I think this uh, theme probably is the most difficult to find out because the latest years was the years with the pandemic. It was very difficult to find out what, how mobility was going on. And uh, we have to say that in mobility, we, have, we are very lucky because we have Transport Authority of Thessaloniki and certain Institute that is quite satisfactory and help us a lot. Last and last but not least, we have to mention the social conditions. Employment and unemployment rates show a different dynamic in all the area. But also almost all municipalities, we can find out that that unemployment women are significantly more than men. We can say that unemployment is a female problem. And as for ages, mainly 30 to 44 are mostly effective. There is a variety of social structures to tackle poverty, operate at the level of municipalities, social groceries, pharmacies, social clinics, but unfortunately we need more. I want also to mention four support structures for women that are victim of violence. We still have work to do with this theme. The majority of the structures is concentrated in the center of the municipality, in the center of municipality. So we need unfortunately work. I believe that uh, I'm finishing actually, and I want to say for a positive thing for the closure of my presentation uh, a message that we need to, uh, we hear we heard also at the plenary session today we need to work all together uh, as Henry Ford said coming together is a beginning keeping together is progress working together is success I believe that we managed the first two steps as a region uh, the previous period we have the next period that we continue our job our work and in this sector, we will work together with the other stakeholders and we'll manage something better for our city. If you want to see more, you can see our site uh, and find out which is thma.gov.gov.
point the GR. And uh, also there you will find the site of the observatory, which we will manage to do it before the end of 2023. Thank you. here for the other um, then uh, we will see that this session is very much like uh, variegated we had like a, a speaker from uh, a regional uh, authority or a regional uh, representative now we will move to Croatia and then we will have uh, Miss Anna Tomicic who comes from the Catholic um, it's the Catholic Catholic, uh, Croatian Catholic University, right? Yeah. So we move to the academia and you all know that uh, the final outcome, like, outcome of this uh, conference is to have all of us speaking together from the institutions, from the academia, from the managing authorities and member states or research institute. So now I just leave the floor to Anna who will talk about um, digital health uptake. Uh, thanks uh, in, the light the, of, in the light of cohesion policy. So, you have 15 minutes, and then I will indicate you when it's five minutes to the end. Well, you can hear me, right? Okay, perfect. Now it's working. Thanks. Um, okay, so, well, um, from my colleague from Greece, we've heard, um, you know, how cohesion policies can address several aspects of one region. And now um, I'd like to focus, um, I don't know if my presentation is on already. Oh, no, it's on. Whoops, what have I done? Okay. Uh, yeah, so now we're, we're, we're going to turn our focus towards um, health and digital health more in more, um, like, in particular. Um, but for starters, I'd like to um, perhaps unpack the title. So it's Croatia full of flag. I'm sure the, the locals will kind of sense um, what it's referring to. It refers to Croatia full of life, which is um, the um, kind of slogan used by the Croatian Tourism Board for kind of like its international campaigns. And since we're talking about health and basically criticizing the, the the state of healthcare in Croatia then um and also our participants have mentioned on several occasions that Croatia is lagging behind so we have Croatia full of flag and uh yeah so basically uh, we'll focus on digital health in the light of European cohesion policies um also yeah sorry I'm presenting this on also on behalf of my of my co-authors Anna Maria who's in the audience and Anto who can make it um, today. Um, yeah, so presentation overview. Um, all right, yeah, so <clears throat> basically, as we're, um, as we're kind of like attending a conference on cohesion policy, I will not kind of dwell uh, too long on what cohesion is and what cohesion policies are. Um, but I'll, I'll just try to kind of perhaps underscore certain aspects of um, that, that are relevant to our argument. So our perhaps kind of undeniable, uh, one perhaps undeniable aspect of cohesion policy is solidarity. And um, a, a concept that kind of falls into this um, concept of solidarity is uh, spatial justice. So this refers to kind of like regional inequalities and also the inequalities between member states and uh, encompasses the the goals of cohesion policies so it's an important concept to keep in mind throughout the the presentation so the concept of spatial justice um so in any case tackling cohesion in the light of this concept of spatial justice highlights the importance of issues of scale in particular the difficult articulation between national and european policies so and in particular in the area of health on which we will um focus today because in contrast to um, the e economic integration uh, process in Europe, the social um, the social field in Europe kind of like pales in comparison. Um, so in the field of health, um, member states have long had kind of exclusive competence. We've seen with COVID-19 that this is more and more um, 
um, kind of like getting redirected on a, on a um, European level. But it's good to, to bear in mind that the EU's first steps in the field of health have been uh, mainly in the area of occupational health. And that is, again, something that kind of goes back to um, this kind of economic integration. Uh, but since uh, like the early 2000s, um, while maintaining this kind of balance between member states' own competencies and the global nature of health issues, the EU has progressively developed health programs to coordinate national policies. Um, yeah, but however, the, the latest OECD health at the glance report shows considerable progress um, in health, but you know, this progress has not really been sufficient to reduce um, socioeconomic inequalities in health at least. So now I'll go, I'll just want to show you this slide before the, the previous one. Um, so this is basically a, a report from the OECD that highlights several shortcomings, specifically to Croatia. So you can see that, um, you know, health status, risk factors and health systems, Croatia is literally um, lagging behind um, the EU average. Um, and well, what, what's kind of like true for all member states that kind of like have this trend of flagging behind, such as Croatia, um, there's, there's basically um, major inequalities between member states and between socioeconomic groups in terms of life expectancy as well. So I think I have the life expectancy slide over here. Yes. Yeah, so you can see the EU average and then Croatia that is really you know, very low and very much behind all of these kind of GDP high um, member states. And we know, know that cohesion policy is kind of um, awarded um, towards the 75, I mean, with, with the, the measure of the 75 percentile. So if you, you know, if you're a poor region, you get more of, uh, of you know, get more funding. And if you're, if you're um, rich, you, you get less. But even though, I'm sorry, even though Croatia, I think, has benefited um, or has been awarded around 9 billion euros since 2014, and, you know, inequalities have not um, really been solved. Um, so, yeah, basically, I'll show, uh, you know, the, this uh, couple of slides. Going back to this one, it basically shows that, you know, the, the poorer you are, you know, classic story, the, the less healthy you are. Um, so at the same time, the decrease in public health expenditure caused by the, you know, whether it's the economic crisis or the health, the most recent kind of like pandemic and health crisis we've had, has led to an increase in household expenditure, which has obviously left the lowest income group, groups worse off. Um, so flagship actions in the new program uh, focus in particular on the prevention of chronic and serious diseases and the use of health innovations um, such as e-health. I'm talking about European, uh, European programs. But um, if we look at e-health in the context of Croatia, and I'm going back to, the, to my fourth slide, um, actually we're not doing that bad at all. Like uh, Croatia... Um, you know, is even above average, like the, the EU average with integration of digital technology. We have good and fast broadband, uh, broadband coverage, a bit less in rural areas, but we do have a harmonized spectrum for 5G. Uh, we have above basic di digital skills, above EU average. And obviously there's a national plan for digital transformation and the economy. Uh, we'll go back to this a bit later uh, with the presentation, but, Overall, it's doing pretty well. Like even the, um, the indicators or the measures such as connectivity or the, the DEC, which refers to the Digital Econ Economy and Society Index, um, it, it is above, uh, sorry, below average, but um, these numbers are really um, kind of very close together with the member states that are, that are above Croatia. So it doesn't mean that we're doing really bad with connectivity, it just means that others are doing better, but it's still, you know, good connectivity basically overall. So this is not the issue, like the, the infrastructure, digital infrastructure is not really what impedes on health. And still, as we've seen with the previous slides, Croatia is really doing not very well um, when it comes to health, really bad. Um, life expectancy as compared to other member states, et cetera. Um, so, uh, wait. 
here. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I honestly think that life expectancy is is kind of overall the best or at least all encompassing in indicator of every single measure, be it health, education, happiness, etc. Um, because plainly people do not tend to live a very long and happy life if, if they're poor and educated and happy and without prospects. So if Croatia has been allocated, um, as I mentioned earlier, since 2014, um, 8.6 billion euros, um, if we have universal health care, if our digital health infrastructure is pretty good over, overall, the question is why do we, do we die so young? Um, so we did a study, this was not at all actually one of our research questions directly, but let me share with you a number of replies from our participants to help kind of like bring light to the issue. So yeah, this is, you know, some aspects of our research. We had 75 participants. I'm not going to go into the methodology, it was really good. Um, and these are kind of like the, the key stakeholders. And we really, I think we, we've, uh, we're one of the studies, actually the only one I know of that has included, you know, such a broad, um, uh, such, such a broad kind of like, uh, such, such broad like groups of stakeholders. So we have hospital manager, jurists, public policy makers, patients, IT engineers, and physicians. So, okay, I'll skip on this one because of time. This is more important. Um, so here's what they say. So um, the first one was like the, the profit oriented kind of aspect of, of healthcare, which is relevant, but um, the one of the aspects that came out through, through our research and that kind of like concerns more um, cohesion policy is the role of politics in the kind of ethical implementation of AI and uh, all of kind of uh, like digital tool, tools in the in the field of healthcare and corruption um, is seen as a major impediment to these policies. So predominantly motivated by again private and corporate interests of the political elite, um, and that trickles down throughout the entire system. So, well, I'm sure you've read already some of uh, the things that our participants had said. My favorite that kind of sums it up is the last one coming from an IT engineer. Uh, and he's talking about a virtual kind of like AI based assistant that we had in uh, one of our scenarios and he's saying, how can you trust the AI based virtual assistant will do a good job if you can't bring it chocolates and brandy. So he's kind of like joking um, around with this, this kind of idea that you, you have to bribe um, doctors to to, you know, get treated or to get an appointment, etc. Um, yeah, so uh, for AI related, both for AI related, okay, and anti-corruption policy, the EU is often regarded as a benevolent regulatory patron, as well as a source of, um, of funding. So I will, again, um, perhaps let you um, kind of skim through um, what the participants say, but basically, um, I also like the, the last one that kind of like sums it up really nicely. Um, and it comes from a physician and he's saying that basically the idea, because of course this is an excerpt from a much longer interview, but the idea is that um, there are so many irregularities that, that um, go kind of like um, un, uh, unaddressed um, in the healthcare system, such as the fact that physicians uh, in the public sector are very often employed as well in the in the private sector so this kind of like this conflict of interest where sometimes they will maybe entice you somehow to to not you know wait for very long in the public sector to get an appointment and then they will offer you to go to the private clinic and stuff like that um and so this physician says when they start introducing ai because of all of this um uh, potential that AI has in 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 the sense of you know tra uh, transparency, um, trust that it creates, and kind of like the, the management of AI is much more objective, and there's no not much space for you know kind of like corruptive um, uh, practices such as these ones. So he says because of the exceptional stupidity in this society, big problems will arise in the process process of implementation. Um, but that's actually not the one that I, I was I had in mind. The other one I had in mind is um, that he says the, the system is too intelligent. 
So this is why we, we kind of avoid implementing it because it, you, we could, it's just that there's no political will and there's probably a reason why there's no political will in that aspect. Okay. Um, so again, there's this you know, myth-making tendency. We've discussed this already actually with um, everything that has already been implemented in the field of digital health in Croatia. So again, this is not really uh, the issue. We could really make the system better, but participants perceive these reforms as cosmetic as they have no substantial impact on pre-existing issues, which again, go back to this kind of you know, inequalities, et cetera. Um, Okay, so I'll skip through this two minutes. Great. Um, yeah, so basically um, these are the goals. So we have the recovery and resilience plan for Croatia that kind of like incorporates cohesion policies within it. And, you know, these are the stated goals and then um, these are the stated challenges. So of course we have a shortage of uh, physicians, um, we have to kind of like uh, cover um, the island areas. Uh, my colleague actually, Ana Maria, was telling me the other day that in Croatia, 0.7% of people do not have access to healthcare at all. And the average in the EU is 0.1, which is, you know, 0.7 doesn't sound like a lot until you compare it to the EU average. So it literally means that almost 1%, one in 100 people in Croatia do not have healthcare access at all, which is really um, shameful. So uh, in the one last minute that I have, I'll just uh, make a couple of suggestions in the sense of pathways to inclusive healthcare. So implementing the concept of mainstreaming. So the integrated approach to health that comes actually from um, like gender uh, inclusion, uh, the concept of mainstreaming. And it, it refers to the, um, um, to the idea that um, in incorporating a, um, you know, this perspective across all levels and areas in the sense of like, for example, in the, at the EU level, the, the realization of uh, the mainstreaming concept would imply a better coordination of the different uh, kind of like health related programs on the, in the level of the EU, such as safety at work, health and digital health, et cetera. And then at member state level, um, this cross cutting requirements implies inter-ministerial cooperation or kind of like whole of government approach. Um, to to increase you know healthy life here is improve social cohesion reduce social inequalities etc uh, adapting health policy to the demographic evolution of the EU this concerns basically uh, the rights of um, immigrants so for now um, you know at the EU level basically uh, the demographic issue of the aging population and and all of these things is is mainly being addressed addressed by the incoming of immigrants but you know we have to kind of solve their access to health care um, taking all vulnerabilities into account so inclusive health these concerns in the particular case of Croatia the Roma community especially um, so there's this need of kind of like develop a patient center care system but um in in bulgaria they've done it actually they kind of like in, implemented um a mediator for the roma community and based on the trust in these mediators this has improved the access of um of roma population to health and social services and of course you know the challenge of prevention i think this is quite clear um and okay conclusive remarks um well, obviously, like the elephant in the room that doesn't get really mentioned much, okay, is um, is global neoliberalism. So just, I know I have to stop, but I just had to mention this part. But uh, so we can't really, you know, address that. But what we can do is reform the way uh, cohesion policies are um, awarded in the sense that we can make it a more democratic process with a consultative approach, such as um, the interviews we've done is really, you know, the voices of people that um, that live through these issues on the ground and that can really inform um, where the funds should be allocated and how they should be used and what they should they should address. So this consultative approach, um, without relying exclusively on national governments, reform plans, and you know, quantitative studies, is is kind of like the gist of our recommendation. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So I think we now stay still in the academia. We move up to Lund University. We are still, I think, without the consultative approach because we will be talking about uh, access, um, accessibility, sustainable mobility, and rural areas. Yeah. And uh, so I just leave the floor to Vanessa Stienborg, who is um, a researcher at the Lund University. So the floor is yours. And you uh, I will just indicate you the timing. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, I will just see. Yeah. My name is Vanessa Schoenboy, and I'm from Lund University. I'm also part of K2, the Swedish Knowledge Center for Public Transport. Uh, now we will be moving to Scandinavia and Sweden. And uh, I will talk a little bit more about balanced regions and uh, <laughs> that is an increased issue in Sweden, uh, since much has been around the larger areas, the urban areas, and uh, it relates a little bit to the spatial justice issue I discussed earlier. A short background, a uh, good level of access is crucial, not only for an active life, but also for uh, getting access to uh, work and studies. Uh, planning in Sweden today is mostly uh, focused on uh, densification in towns and around uh, stations where municipalities are linked. Yeah, and also regions are linked by railway. And it's quite a heavy focus on that. Uh, there is a general reduction in public transport. Uh, we can see that the car use in smaller areas and rural areas are increasing. We can also see decreased uh, service levels in smaller villages and uh, uh, towns, uh, which creates a negative sp spiral. And we can see a clear sh uh, shift a need for a shift from the transport policy or car-oriented paradigm, uh, where we also highlight micro practices among planners and decision makers. Our case in this project uh, was Pergatog Nordust, which is a collaborative railway initiative which involved 16 municipalities in two regions in Southern Sweden. And it was an initiative that uh, collected business, the municipalities, the regional administrations and the national level. Uh, this initiative led to that in December 2013, 10 new railway stations were opened in the Northeastern Skåne and Southern Småland. The desire of opening those stations was to integrate the housing and labor markets with other parts of the regions and to provide an improved and more energy efficient uh, alternative to road transport. However, at the same time, there were significant cuts in bus traffic, uh, especially in the region of Skåne. Here you can, oh, you can almost see anything of it. I'm sorry, <laughs> it wasn't that in my presentation. Uh, but our, here is Praga Tagnodus. Here, supposed to be a map of Sweden showing the two regions in southern Sweden. Uh, most of the focus is in the western part of Sweden, and the area we are in now is more in the eastern part of Sweden. The aim of the project was to shed a light on the role of public transport in small towns and rural areas and to highlight any potential obstacles to the shift to a more transport efficient society. Uh, we used a mixed method approach. We conducted a survey, included 15 smaller towns in the two regions. This was a follow up from an earlier uh, project that we had. We reached 1,430 respondents, and the survey consisted of three parts. We also used microdata for a deeper understanding of the context. 
Uh, we conducted case studies with four municipalities uh, where we did site visits. We did interviews with politicians and officials within those municipalities. We also did the newspaper analysis to put the Pyagatog Nordus and the, that initiative in its context. So the results, um, looking at media, it was clear that Pyagatog Nordus was described both negatively and positively uh, in the media. And the critique uh, was mostly concerned the cutbacks in the bus service. Here's one quote, more train station means new businesses are established and more jobs are created. New housing is built, the, the schools have a student base, businesses can stay open, confidence in the future in every location will increase. Another quote, uh, many people were affected by the cutbacks in bus services and there were strong protests from passengers. Upper secondary students and commuters were hit particularly badly. Another quote, both cities and rural areas need a well-functioning public transport system and infrastructure which links the whole of the region, Skåne, together. Moving forward to some uh, short results from the survey, we could see that the main mode of transport is still the car in those smaller villages. Trips by train had, did not increase. Uh, and overall, there is a positive attitude to the train stations where the respondents saw that they are important for the development and attractiveness of the smaller town. However, they still see public transport as a challenge, and about 20% of the respondents travels less with public transport since the opening of the new stations. We can, could also see by looking at the microdata that there was a low match between labor markets and the railway connection. People lived and work in other uh, locations than the railway took them. Results from the interviews, we could, uh, the municipalities were struggling with challenges with demographic changes. A uh, higher percentage of the population is, are getting older. They also struggling with the uh, rundown places, smaller towns that are rundown or where the development has been static for many years. In some ways, it has even gone in reverse. Uh, and this was also true for the towns who had new stations. Uh, they're struggling with the high level of dependency in cars. And they also saw the centralization of service as a constant threat uh, for the smaller towns. Was that me doing something? Yeah. Which, oh, sorry. Um, they all, the municipalities and the informant all regarded public transport as very important for uh, rural areas and smaller villages. They saw it important for growth, attractiveness and establishment of businesses. They also saw clear social dimension where public transport, especially they were especially relating to the bus services, could be a link between the smaller towns and uh, linking small towns to the service hubs. Uh, they regard railway services as important, but they underline the significance of bus services for those areas. And here is one quote from one informant, give buses and train equal weight. Uh, they describe how bus services is becoming particularly important in those municipalities who are covering a large area with many small urban communities, which is the case many times in Sweden, since we are not that very dense. 
they also saw that the geographical conditions must be taken into account when planning for public transport. You cannot see at regions in the same way. You need to look at the context within the regions because in Sweden, the planning is much about calculating uh, the distances now in the public transport. Um, here you can see some pictures from one of the stations and in relation to the towns which had station, they uh, the informants describe a reality where not much had happened around the stations, this both because of municipalities limited economy, uh, as well as long leading times in the planning process. Um, and as you can see here is, uh, as at the example, uh, that even though it was almost 10 years since the opening of the station, there is still a, a lack of connections with walking and cycling to the station. Uh, and the station is located in the outskirts of the town, uh, and it is a rather desolated uh, place, which is not very well integrated. And here you can see the station from the other side. Uh, some informant meant that measurements for uh, integrating the station should have been a priority early in the planning process. Okay, now let's move on. Uh, during our work, we could, uh, the informants discussed a, lot, a line of obstacles to the shift to a more transport efficient and, uh, and sustainable society. Uh, sorry for the quality here as well. Uh, they saw uh, an oversimplified way of measuring public transport. Again, they saw that it is necessary to place weight on the different geographical context, uh, uh, circumstances. They also saw a reasonable uh, uh, a gap between policy documents and how issually, issues are actually managed in practice. Uh, According to the cutbacks in bus services, they could see that this was particularly important for some groups, for example, young people. And they questioned what does the full service actually mean in public transport, that you cannot see two buses in the morning and two buses in the evening as a reasonable uh, service level. They also discussed priorities, how those constantly need to be drawn from the municipal level and how the political debate on transport related issues sometimes can be insufficient and deprioritized among everything else. They also regard the question of transport as a sensitive question from uh, the habitant's perspective, since it can feel uncomfortable and need to be with small steps at a time. According to the national, regional and local level, uh, which are all included in the planning process in Sweden, within these kind of uh, initiatives, they see that there is few people who know what are doing what, and that in, there is a confusion regarding the division of responsibility between the different levels. They also can see that there are many ideas about new solution, new mobility solutions in rural areas, small towns, but who is going to take the responsibility? There is no one that uh, takes a clear responsibility for this. And, uh, they describe the issue as too complicated to do on the local level uh, alone. They also saw a need for a broader scoop during the planning of major infrastructure projects, such as new train stations, and that, you're, that they are looking broader on what areas are actually affected and, the, and the, to maximize the benefits and to uh, integrate those like the stations from the beginning. Uh, they also saw a need of an integrate increased system pr perspective based on the whole journey. And they saw this as a key issue for rural 
and areas and small towns, and a need for a greater collaboration across municipal and county borders, where they also saw a need for a, an increased national presence uh, when, um, thank you. Um, social perspectives, they described uh, small villages, small towns who now have no access uh, to public transport, especially since the cutbacks in bus services in favor of the trains. They described double exclusion uh, in many of those places where uh, there was a high percentage of immigrants uh, living in those places uh, combined with many Swedes, people that uh, are unemployed, which they called for double exclusion, uh, where they described the uh, access to public transport as especially important. They also described digitalization as a challenge Besides, it offers possibilities, but it's a, it can also be a challenge, whereas some people is falling behind those de developments, especially since uh, not every of those areas have sufficient broadband, uh, for example, or access to internet, and not everyone know how to use it. So to sum up, uh, we could see that the importance of Public transport for small uh, towns and rural areas is broad. It includes like growth, attractiveness, well-functioning business and commerce, social well-being, and quality of life. They describe bus services particularly important uh, for more sparsely populated mun municipalities. They highlight the mobility poverty and accessibility poverty as two urgent issues. And the shift to a more transport efficient society is engulfed in a series of challenges. Thank you very much for that. Thank you very much. So we move now to our uh, four speakers. I'm taking my online program. So we move from uh, rural and um, peripheral areas or more, uh, let's say, less two very large cities. And we will have like Ivan Topsis from Metropolitan Research Institute in Budapest talking about uh, the relationship between cohesion policy and large urban areas. And in the meantime, well, I will just, uh, for the final questions, maybe I will invite the speakers later. I will put four chairs there in front of everybody so you can address all the questions of the audience and questions that are coming from Zoom in case. So 15 minutes and like the others, and I will indicate when it's uh, five and okay. two. Thank you very much. Uh, this is how the 21st century began. It was not a very, very good start. Uh, and uh, the war is not even on this, uh, on this slide. Uh, the major, what is that? Yeah, the major uh, statement uh, of my uh, presentation is that there is, a, there is an allocational tension between cohesion policy and the large urban areas. Large urban areas are thought to be richer than, uh, than other parts of Europe, so they are disadvantaged in, in the cohesion policy. On the other hand, most of the problems, they, are, uh, they, they come up in large urban areas and also the solutions predominantly can be found in large urban areas. So my question is, how can this allocation uh, tension be handled is it possible to give more support to larger, area, larger urban areas and metropolises, which are suffering the most from the crisis, without giving up the original intentions of cohesion policy? So uh, what are the territorial aspects of, uh, of the multiple crisis? And I talk about multiple crises because uh, uh, it is not only climate, it is not only the pandemic, it's not only energy, but all together. Uh, uh, these are uh, uh, these are really these have to be handled together, and uh, the cities are in the front line to fight uh, all this uh, all this uh, uh, crisis. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, also in the in the climate uh, issue, uh, many of the interventions should be done in uh, in the most dense uh, urban areas. Uh, parallel to the increase of the task, uh, especially during the pandemic. 
the revenues of the, of the local governments were sharply decreasing. So in fact, they were financial crisis uh, uh, also uh, occurring in the large cities and uh, uh, many countries had to give emergency financial support to the local level. This is, a, this is an OECD slide which shows how much additional tasks uh, came to the, uh, to the local level, how much their revenues uh, uh, decreased. And in fact, the health crisis is now uh, followed by uh, financial and economic and social crisis. And after all this, now we are in the public finance, public finance crisis. And the increase of inflation in many of our countries is probably linked directly to this, uh, to this problem. In fact, it is very important to act in an integrated way on this uh, crisis. It cannot be dealt uh, one by one. Uh, and I will just uh, show you uh, a few examples from non-integrated uh, uh, interventions. But first, I have to, un uh, have to underscore the importance of the territorial scale. And in my opinion, it is the functional urban area and the metropolitan area where all these aspects can can be handled together. Here are some examples of non-integrated interventions. You can build a technology park, which is far away from the city center, soaking out the talents from the, from the city. You can, you can push carbon uh, down to the earth or, or to the water, extremely expensive interventions, taking away money with low efficiency from other resources. You can put the Roma people into housing. Uh, uh, th their housing uh, conditions are improving, but they get usually further away from the job opportunities because no one city accepts Roma people, new, new Roma settlements in their city. And you can make compact development like in the last picture, uh, which makes the cities extremely dense. And, and then the city starts to rebuild good social housing, demolishing social housing and building even more dense housing. So uh, in fact, uh, yeah, uh, in fact, there are now new visions which are available for cities and I just, uh, uh, which are available for local governments. And I just listed a few here, the accessibility shift, the carbon neutrality and energy revolution, the food revolution with proximity food, uh, and also the mixity of, uh, of population. These are new visions which have to be implemented uh, in uh, uh, on, uh, by, by municipalities, especially by, by, by the large uh, cities. And again, I think that uh, these visions like the 15-minute city or the cities as prosumers uh, of renewable energy, they have the best chances to be implemented in, in larger urban areas. Uh, this is, a, this is a, a example of a good collaboration. Lille is a city of 200,000 people, but Lille Metropole is 1.2 million people and 85 local governments collaborate together and all the mayors are sitting together in a board and they make decisions together about the area of Lille. Uh, on the territorial aspects of EU policies, in fact, uh, uh, urban areas uh, uh, get some money from uh, uh, sectoral office, from the regional office and of the from the sustainable urban development uh, initiatives, but they don't get really much money directly uh, from EU-wide initiatives. In fact, cohesion policy allows that national level gives money uh, to metropolitan areas, but this depends fully on the, on, the, on the member states. And in the last sentence, you can see that the money which is devoted to urban areas, which is six percentage of ERDF, is mostly spent on the level of cities followed by neighborhoods and the functional urban areas is, is, is only 20% of this money. So uh, also there are other EU policies where the territorial focus is not clear at all. For example, the Fit for 55 package does not really clarify on which territories uh, uh, urban uh, environment uh, should be improved. <clears throat> uh, there are EU contradictions which, which are present since long. For example, the total uh, separation between urban and rural issues, two DGs which uh, cooperate sometimes, uh, but most times they do not cooperate, uh, uh, making the functional urban area cooperation very difficult if some of the settlements are urban and others are rural. And uh, the gatekeeper role of uh, the national governments is extremely strong 
uh, which means that almost all EU resources are decided by the national government how to further allocate. Uh, only if, uh, this is a, uh, in a conflict with the statement that only a few countries have dedicated national urban policies. I could mention France, Netherlands, and Germany, and other countries probably do not have. In fact, we can say that the national governments are hijacking uh, EU money. This can be very clearly, clear, clearly seen on the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which is totally allocated in a top-down way, not in most countries with no discussion uh, with any sub-national level. Uh, decisions have to be done quickly. National governments decide quickly, and they usually get from the uh, from the drawer plans which they had earlier. And these plans do not really address uh, uh, the reform needs uh, reaction on the present situation. I think larger role should be given in planning and implementation to the elected local governments and to metropolitan uh, countries uh, councils. And here on the last, uh, again, in the last sentence, uh, I compare the recovery fund to the United States program where Biden has a similar amount of money program, $350 billion than the EU has. And uh, in this case, a certain percentage of the money was directly given to metropolitan cities. And there are many interviews with mayors, how happy they were that they got finally money to uh, to implement their own plans and they they don't have to follow the state uh, the state level now uh, just a bracket about the uh, east central european countries uh, we are one in one of these countries and i'm coming from a neighboring country uh, from hungary uh, uh, in these uh, countries in some of them the situation is even worse uh, the uh, large cities are not only disadvantaged in cohesion policy, but also politically. For example, in Hungary and in Poland, uh, uh, many of the large cities are against the central government, and the central governments are really trying to get away tax incomes, et cetera, from the large cities, which means that they are not advantaged by cohesion policy, and they are even less advantaged by the national policy. They are on paper high GDP per capita areas, but in fact, they are almost collapsing local governments. Uh, so, uh, again, it is easy to say for the national government that I will give now money for the small cities, and the reality is that they give money for the small cities because they are more loyal uh, to, the, uh, to, the, to the central governments. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, this is also quite problematic because in fact, I think that the large cities are also democratically very important regarding from political perspective. I would again take the US example when under President Trump, it, it were the large cities which were the sanctuary cities protecting the migrants and similar uh, role is played now in Europe by, by those large cities which are against their nationalist, uh, nationalist government. Now, uh, how to tackle this tension? And I have a few suggestions here. First of all, uh, of course, the sustainable urban development share, which was six percentage now in this uh, program, period, it is eight percentage of ERDF, could be further developed. But even more important, the metropolitan areas and the cities should get a higher co-financing share. There should be uh, not only the opportunity given to spend this money on metropolitan level, but there should also be given some initiative that if you spend it on metropolitan level, then EU money can uh, play a higher co-financing. Uh, uh, the, the EU money can, the uh, EU support can be higher. And then another statement is that a larger share of EU money should be given directly to large cities and metropolitan uh, functional urban areas through thematic programs. Now. If you talk with an EU uh, person, uh, he or she will say this is impossible. This would be against the constitution of the European Union. European Union is a shared, shared management program for member states, not for cities and, um, and, uh, and metropolitan areas. However, it is possible to, go, to give more money through, through the Green New Deal, uh, uh, launching programs for, uh, for, for large, large cities, in, in climate governments, et cetera. It is possible to make the Connecting Europe facility uh, more linked to the 
the wishes of the of the of the large cities. I just can tell you that I came yesterday from Budapest to Zagreb by train, and you can talk about this train as a small speed train uh, making the 350 kilometers within six and a half hours, which is really a, a tragedy in the center of Europe between two capital cities having this kind of. Uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, transport. If this would be in Western Europe, it could be two hours and then not, not, not six and a half hours. Uh, Horizon Europe should uh, also uh, have uh, more programs for large cities and the European Urban Initiative could have a larger financial allocation and, uh, and uh, having more priorities on that. Now, where should the money come from? I think if you, if you take this exam, this, uh, drawing, then you see that one of the big pots of the EU money is cohesion policy, another big pot is agricultural policy. Many people say that this kind of, this size of agricultural policy is totally unjust, uh, uh, totally against all the principles of uh, sustainable urban development. So my statement would be not to reduce cohesion policy, but take away some money from ag common agricultural policy. But coming back to this slide, uh, uh, again, an argument is that you cannot give money to, to uh, metropolitan areas because they don't have an elected mayor, they don't have the democratic basis. Again, this is not true because if you look at the ITI programs, for example, in Polish cities, it is enough to have an ITI association, it is enough to have a strategy, and they get hundreds of millions uh, of euros money. So if you have an if you have a body and if you have a strategy which was decided by this body in which all the mayors are included, I think this gives enough uh, democratic uh, legitimation. How can the control be handled? People say that we cannot increase the European Commission because if we have more uh, programs for cities, we would need more bureaucrats to control these programs. This is again a problem which you can solve. You can uh, outsource the control. And if you outsource the control, this will, uh, this will be cheaper for the EU because then also the corruption will be less if uh, cities and metropolitan areas have to report back to an EU body than to their national government. So you will win more money than lose on outsourcing. Uh, here, uh, we come back to the recovery and resilience uh, facility. Uh, this was a disaster, in my opinion, how it was implemented in this uh, uh, in, the, in the first time. Of course, we can say that the decisions had to be done quickly, but again, a lot of money will be spent on things which are not really reform oriented. Next time, from the beginning on, uh, uh, this kind of facility should be planned and implemented in a totally different way, giving quite substantial role to the subnational level. And also the representatives of the NGOs and the local level should be included into the monitoring. And again, there is an example for that. There, is, there are the EU integra integrity uh, pacts, which exist as a pilot project where the concrete EU projects are really controlled by bodies in which NGOs uh, are involved. Uh, I would suggest an EU uh, urban Agenda Partnership on Metropolitan and Functional Urban Area Cooperation. I would suggest an open method of coordination procedure to, uh, to help urban development programs uh, develop uh, on the EU level, and also a new wave of meaningful ways of urban-rural uh, relationship. So I, I think this is the uh, almost the, uh, the final slide. Uh, of course, the, uh, the capacities of, uh, of local and metropolitan bodies have to be, have to be strengthened. Urbect, uh, which is a existing programs, it could be uh, a, an important source uh, uh, for that uh, in, in cooperation with the European Urban uh, Initiative. Uh, so uh, I think that the general aim of cohesion policy to prioritize poorer and lagging behind areas should, be, should not be given up. It is very important, but the EU should find ways to support more the metropolitan conurbations and functional urban areas, which are important allies on the way towards sustainable and resilient development. There is a conflict here, but this conflict can be solved. Thank you. So I thank all four uh, speakers. Maybe I invite them uh, maybe to Oops. Yes. 
so maybe it's uh, just if there is any question from the audience and uh, oh, yes yeah please Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Ivan Novak, Ministry of Regional Development and New Funds, Zagreb. I have one particular question for our colleague from Croatian University, Croatian Catholic University. Uh, could you explain maybe a bit uh, what kind of data in respect to e-health and cohesion policy you used to draw up certain conclusions based on which your work has been presented, because it seems that we have maybe some alter, alternative informations maybe to share with you. Thank you very much. Okay, then I, no, no problem, I can do, I can just. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks for your question. Um, I mean, our conclusions were not drawn only upon, um, you know, uh, like reports um, from government, like governmental reports or great literature or scientific literature in general, but in combination with what our participants had said, because I think it's really important to, again, as I, I'll reiterate, reiterate what I said earlier, to take into account what the people really experience on the ground. Now, I'm not sure to which slide of my presentation you're referring to i think i've um i've actually listed my sources for all of the graphs so basically it's the OECD. oecd so I, I don't know like could you tell me which one is conflictual with um yeah thank you very much yes it is maybe hard to say conflictual because actually uh, during the 1420 period, Croatia didn't put so much fu uh, funding uh, to the e-health because this is something that actually is uh, growing uh, in tension in 21-27 as well as the uh, uh, RRP. So uh, this is something maybe th that should be clarified to what extent actually some expectations were made based on the funding available for, from cohesion policy, because we know that e-health is something that has been funded, but it is not funded solely by the cohesion policy fund. So maybe this should be also distinction made to a level that would be understand for all of us. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so, <clears throat> yeah, of course, I mean, um, I did not perhaps have the time and maybe I should have mentioned that, of course, digital health is something pretty recent. So obviously the entire fund of like 8.6 billion was not at all allocated all of it to, to digital health, nor to health exclusively. But um, what I was trying to point out is that um, although we do have even though, you know, independently of cohesion policies, we do have a good infrastructure nowadays with digital health, but we still have uh, bad health. Um, so um, I was trying to point out basically how interconnected all of these aspects are, especially digital health with, you know, health, and then health has, again, several aspects to it. And these are, you know, all of the socioeconomic um, aspects that me and, and several, I mean, all of my colleagues actually have kind of um, underscored this aspect that so many things go into health. Um, and we should we should use, you know, the integrated approach that, again, um, perhaps Ivan has um, um, kind of elaborated um, in, in, in great detail. I think it was a very useful presentation for all of us today. Um, and yeah, so the, the point is that the, the basis of, of our society has to kind of um, use cohesion funds to, to fix this lack of interconnected um, action uh, when using these funds. And then I, I, I guess we have a shot at least at um, you know, fighting inequality between member states and then you know, getting a better quality of life overall in Europe. Thanks. So Ivan, thank you for your presentation. I came back. I was it's a pity that I was not following other presentations. My name is Gojko Bežovan, coming from Zagreb University. Then my point is, is to, to clarify some, some of that idea you do have as an open method of coordination related to the to the urban development we do have here in place now. 
do you see that it might be relevant even to extend it like like in in the one way like cross border cooperation in the morning colleagues of mine was asking me to follow tomorrow one debate on the development of the part of the city here we do have as a grid it's huge brownfield and i was suggesting to them that it was very much worth to visit let's say corvina that uh, quarter you develop in in in, in Budapest, Budapest as uh, an option to learn and very much they are very much obsessed what's going on in Amsterdam what's going on in 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 Vienna what's going on in Paris and in other cities and they're not very much aware that we should learn from other transitional countries from other transitional uh, cities for what's going on especially looking for the uh, implementation of EU funding Thank you. The open method of coordination is a second best option. It is a tool which you can use if you cannot really make a directive or something. It is a weak tool of, of the EU. It means that if you have an open method of coordination in a question, then each country has to make a report what they did in this regard. And this re report is peer reviewed by other countries. And then the commission makes a suggestion how to improve the situation. So but there is no compulsory part of it. So this is a, a, a tool which calls the attention of a lack of a policy. And I think it is very important that European countries have a lack of national urban policies. In most countries, the urban, urban agenda is not really strong. It is uh, the, the rural agendas and the, the lagging behind regions are much stronger taken on board and also agriculture, etc. cetera, than what, what, what to do with the with, with the cities and what kind of networks of cities are existing in the countries and how these networks of cities can be used for the development of the country. So I, my, my argument is that because we cannot change the EU constitution or the, the basic documents, at least we should use tools which are weaker but could make a step forward. Uh, what you said about uh, brownfield uh, cooperation, et cetera, there are some existing forms for that. You can form an urban network from different cities. Uh, you, can, you, can rake a, you can raise a proposal for Interreg or Horizon Europe uh, projects. So some kind of possibilities are there, but these, these are also not enough, in my opinion. Yes, hello, thank you. Fabian Gall. I am... Um... Uh, work for the managing authority in, in France and in Auvergne Rhone Alpes region, um, where a decision has been um, taken to also divert funding away from metropolitan areas and to uh, direct them more towards middle sized uh, regions. Now, I hear your, um, your, your, your presentations, Ivan, about uh, the Hungarian case, which I'm a bit familiar with. Um, also, and um, I hear your arguments about trying to circumvent or bypass uh, these decisions and directly allocate um, funding to metropolitan cities uh, directly because of the needs that they have. My question is, is this argument not in tension with the shared management principle and also the territorial approaches that we are discussing so much in, in cohesion policy, in a sense that we um, think that the decisions about the allocation of funding should be taken at the local or, or regional level or subsidiarity at, at the lower level. So does that not also mean that we should, in that case, accept that kind of decisions to take funding away from metropolitan areas? Yes, even if we're not happy with them. I'm not sure if the last bit of my presentation was okay. Yeah. I think just the opposite. I mean, uh, uh, the European uh, Union is a shared program with member states. So 90% of all the funds go to the member states and then the member states allocate it further. My statement is that this is wrong. But because we cannot change it, because it is really a constitution and 27 member states signed it and we can never change it because always you will find a few which object it. 
I would say that the EU should increase those this 10 percentage to 20 or 30, where they do not give the money to the member states, but give directly to the recipients who are the best to use it. And this is what Biden did in the US, give some portion of the money, only certain percentage, but certain percentage is much more than zero, which is the case in Europe, to the metropolitan cities. And you have governments of metropolitan cities which allocate which are running the cities, which are responsible for that. They are directly elected, they are strong, and they allocate in each year much more money than the EU money, uh, which they could get. So it, they, you cannot make any arguments that these bodies are not prepared for that. So for this, this is my argument, looking for these options, possibilities, where you can go more directly to these, uh, to these bodies. And I am very uh, sad about the French story that money was taken away. So this is not the way to go. As you said at your presentation, the previous period, we had the European Union so, uh, give the guidelines to, to spend to integrated territorial investments, 6%. In our region, in the region of Santa Macedonia, was decided to spend almost 10%. Uh, so I think that the region has the, and nowadays it say it, as you said, through the new program, the region has the opportunity to change this by their role. The regional operation program so i think uh, if and the new period we will see better things because we have as you said the factional area in the previous period we had neighborhoods we had to uh, identify problematic areas for the strategy in order to spend and um, this wasn't very well very good for us very helpful for us but they make they made steps in this period it's very triggered with, for us but we have to say that it's a little bit late because we have 22 it's the period 21 to 27 and we don't have the opportunity yet to start the greek ropes especially the regional ropes uh, were uh, agreed and we uh, signed it uh, just the september of 22 so we have to run a little bit in order to to see all those monies we hope to see something better. But I think that they are made good steps on this because they decide to spend more money. And even if a, if a metropolitan, as you said, uh, it's a difficult in Greece, even we don't have metropolitan governors. We have regional and municipalities. This uh, only for Thessaloniki and Athens, the two great cities, we have this type of uh, categories. And this is a problem for us. It's, I don't know, for your country. Thank you. But I think it was the decision of your national government to give 10 percent to Ginterva 6. My statement is that most national governments are not thinking in that way. And they don't give anything to the functional urban area opportunity. So this, this depends. National governments are really the gatekeepers. They are really deciding about everything. I have a question for Vanessa, and um, I've seen in, in your um, your presentation maybe when you talk about like solutions for uh, rural areas or um, remote areas was mainly like uh, urban no, public transport. So how to switch from bus to train, how making train connections more football. But I mean, I've been reading some some papers lately, and they were talking for um, I think especially it's a case study for uh, a German speaking province in Belgium. They talk about. Um, uh, drive sharing, ride sharing opportunities. So for those uh, rural areas where basically public transport is not uh, viable, it's too expensive, it's too it's scattered. Uh, if you have thought maybe to, oh, you have already, we talk about micro practices. I didn't know if of micro, micro practices were those share riding options or something else, or if you have uh, thinking of introducing some questions in your survey, whether the population in those areas would be ready, and even the governments, because in some cases I've seen that this uh, um, uh, share riding is initiated by the government, by the city government with some uh, governmental cars. And then uh, like to give maybe the kickoff to a practice, and then more and more can share there uh, where it's not possible to go by buses, to reach people by bus or train. Uh, yeah, uh, we have those kind of initiatives in Sweden as well, uh, the ride sharing and so. Mostly those are based on uh, 
what do you call it in English? Uh, very um, people that are uh, doing it voluntarily, uh, that are really fighting for the environment and for the village and the access to different places. So again, there was the issue about responsibility, who is taking the responsibility for such solutions, which is a quite uh, tricky question uh, from that perspective. Uh, we have some ongoing research projects where they um, have included like uh, the municipal, the local level and the regional and they are having like some points if you uh, choose to ride sharing instead of taking uh, the car and then you can go to the supermarket and buy for those <laughs> points in some way. Uh, so there are ongoing, but to make it on a larger scale, that's the challenge is and who who takes the responsible for uh, that. Uh, then there was one more thing I was thinking about, but I totally forgot. I, did you have a second question or no? Okay. Uh, yeah, but yeah okay and uh, no we did not include that uh, question in our survey uh unfortunately it would be a good one but this survey was based on uh, the service that we uh, not me but my colleagues were conducted in uh, early 2000s and to compare them we had included the same questions but like the officials and the politicians said it's a very tricky question to change the travel habits among uh, the inhabitants and you need to do it in very small spe steps talking about increasing uh, decreasing the car use is very very sensitive uh, so they are doing it very slowly and very very small steps <laughs> thank you any other question no so i would like to thank all our speakers for this very, very fruitful and nice and food for thought in terms of the how cohesion policy can contribute to the different challenges at different levels. And I think it's only me now between us and the coffee break. So enjoy the rest of the day, the panel session, and then also there will be like some early career researchers panels later on. Thank you very much. Thank you.